Thanks, John. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is say I was remiss and I did not put uh, Ruslan on the slides. Um, Ruslan uh, is responsible for all the pixels you see on this screen, um, making it from the HDMI port and up to here. So, <coughs> so yeah, I'm I'm here today to talk to you about FreeBSD. Uh, my my slightly snarky title is uh, you know memory safety in FreeBSD without rewriting. Um, you know, in in lieu of the Rust talk, which it, uh, all the Rust email threads and whatnot. Um, we provide memory safety for C and C++. So um, I'm going to move on here and talk about what Cherry is. Um, many of you have probably seen, in fact, this slide in some, or at least these words in some form in the past, but uh, a refresher for everyone who hasn't. So Cherry is a processor architecture protection model. Um, it composes a capability system model uh, with using hard with hardware and software, um, and it does this in part by adding new security primitives to instruction set uh, architectures, so ISAs. Um, and, and then it's implemented in the microarchitecture and in the memory controller um, on the CPU and on the, on the system on chip. And it enables new security behaviors in software. It's, it is specifically designed uh, to mitigate vulnerabilities in C and C++ trusted computing bases. So think hypervisors, operating systems, language runtimes, uh, browsers, whatnot. Um, it's important to know that um, these runtimes are part of even systems like Go, which try not to actually use C at all. Um, when they talk to another through a fun foreign function interface or something, they're using a C interface. So uh, Cherry can help in those cases. Um, Cherry provides fine-grained memory protection um, and deterministically closes all manner of attacks. Um, well, it can prevent arbitrary code execution in many cases, um, and it makes it really hard to exploit. In fact, one of the problems we have in demonstrating the uh, compartmentalization that I'll talk, that one of us at least will talk about a little bit about later, is that we don't have any good attacks against Cherry programs, so it's really hard to say, oh, well, now you can't break out, because now you, you still can't do anything. Uh, most of the time. We know, we know there will be attacks, uh, but for now, it's actually quite hard. In addition, on, and I guess on top of memory safety, Cherry enables extremely fine-grained compartmentalization. So we'll, we'll get to that uh, later. So how does it work? Well, the, the fundamental piece of Cherry is uh, the Cherry capability. Um, we take a, an existing pointer, so a 64-bit virtual address, and we extend it to 128 bits plus a tag. Um, and inside that extra extension, we add bounds permi and permissions and some other things. Um, and then we require that the uh, capability be manipulated with guarded manipulation, which is to say special instructions um, are, are used to make any changes. If you use those instructions in a way which would violate the properties of monotonicity, uh, which is to say try to make the capability reference something it didn't already, then the tag is stripped and you can no longer use it. Um, in a Cherry system, all memory accesses are via a capability. So that's either explicitly, which will be the case in most of the things we're talking about today, uh, where you have a load via capability instruction, um, or implicitly, um, so in a, in a uh, hybrid programming model where most pointers remain integers, there's a default data capability and a default program counter capability. Um, and that, that provides us with complete backward compatibility. So to make it all work and to provide memory safety, we do have to restrict C and C++ a little bit. Um, most of the changes are quite minor. They're around clarity about pointer providence expressions. For instance, if you add two uh, UN pointer T's together, um, the compiler may not be able to figure out which one of those um, is actually a pointer and which is an offset, so you'll need to tell it. Um, and then type use must preserve pointer provenance, which is to say you can't take a pointer, cast it to a long, and then cast it back to a pointer, because a long doesn't have anywhere to store all that metadata. Um, 
So, and then likewise, copying, so using memcopy to copy a data structure, or uh, a sort, you know, sort doing a swap, um, you need to modify it slightly. For ordinary programs, these considerations take, have, have little impact. Um, for instance, OpenSSH required maybe three changes and currently requires zero. Um, so, and many programs in the, in the previous D-Tree we've never touched. So, pretty cool there that we have, we have pretty strong compatibility. And generally speaking, the changes we have to make um, improve the clarity of the code. It's a, you do a, you're, you're simply expressing your intent to the compiler in a better way, and then hopefully you're also expressing it better to the next person who has to read it, um, including yourself. Um, and then there are a few bits of Cherry, such as changing the bounds on a capability um, or changing the permissions, which are outside the C language. They can't be expressed in standard C, and for that we use compiler intrinsics um, to use the, use the appropriate instructions. So once you've, once you've made these changes, what you get is a memory safe C and C++ for some definition. Um, in particular, it's spatial safety at the level of C objects. So a thing returned by malloc, or something you, uh, a variable that you create a, a global variable, global array, global integer, whatever. Um, you, the spatial safety is at that level. So if you have an array, by default, um, if you pass a, a, a reference to some element of the array, you're still passing around the bounds of the whole array um, because otherwise not doing so would violate the expectations of C programmers and the C standard. Um, in addition to the spatial safety, we've been able to build a heap temporal safety, which Mark will talk about in a bit, um, where we prevent uh, use after reallocation. So you don't have to worry about two, two malloc returns aliasing each other um, and, uh, and bugs happening there. Um, I guess to, to continue on sort of what has to change, um, you might have noticed that uh, in, in the example of the capability that we had a 64-bit address and then we only had 64 bits of metadata, but somehow we have to have a bottom and a top of that, uh, a, 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 base and a, a base and a top um, of the valid range. So we're to make that work, we're compressing the, uh, we're, we're, we're compressing the bounds relative to the address. Um, that in turn, that's a, you know, so basically like floating point. Um, and that uh, means that larger regions have less precision. So if you, if you allocate anything with, or if you, if you want to set bounds within a page, you always get byte precision. Um, once you get to larger sizes, at some point that decays and you have to add a little more padding. Now, the good news is that's pretty natural. Your allocators already do that because nobody needs an allocator for, you know, you know a megabyte minus one allocations. Um, that's just not a thing. Um, and it would be pretty ridiculous to cater to that. Um, so typically these changes are pretty small, but there are some, some oddities. Um, so if you have a re really large, weird-sized allocation, you may need to pad it a bit. Um, or things like uh, the pattern in the kernel, where we allocate a UIO, um, and then also the space for the IOVEC that goes with it, um, you may need to either add some padding there or split them up. Generally speaking though, pretty minor changes. Um, I'm not gonna go into any more detail about that here in part because I have a talk here, so you should skip Kirk's talk and come to mine if you're interested. Uh, also, I think Jason, Jason's, sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna try to give a quick demo here. We'll see how it goes with a hand mic and keyboard. <laughs> so. The first thing to note is I am running on a Cherry system. So it, uh, it shows itself as FreeBSD because changing the name and new name would screw everything up, so we don't do that. Um, but it is running CherryBSD. Um, the, probably the interesting point here to most people is that Let's see, where are we? So yeah, so the kernel, um, the kernel is a ARM64, ARCH64C kernel. 
Um, ARCH64C is what we're calling the Morello uh, extension. So this is running on ARM's prototype hardware. It's a four core, 2.4 gigahertz, ARMv8.2 system with Cherry extensions. Um, and then the other thing of note here is that we have generic Morello peer cap. Um, the peer cap part means that in this kernel, all pointers are capabilities. Um, there's another compilation mode um, that we won't talk about in any great detail today, um, where only some pointers are capabilities, so especially annotated pointers. This is really useful for bring up sometimes, but it makes for very large code diffs, um, and it's kind of annoying in a lot of ways. So we don't, we're mostly not using that. Um, but here, you know, so we're, we're running Cherry. Now let me pull up the next thing. So here we have a, a simple program. Um, we don't have quite enough listing, sorry. Um, but uh, a sim simple program which overflows a buffer. Um, there's a, my GDB foo is not up to this, uh, particular time. It's a, anyway, uh, here we go. So yeah, so we have a, we have a buffer, character buffer, or a, a character, we have a buffer, uh, pointer to the buffer, and uh, we're gonna, try to write uh, too much to it. So here we go, and then let's go ahead and run. Or, no, continue, that'll work. There we are. So capability bounds violation, we received sigprot. Um, the interesting thing here is that we have, a, we have a capability here. We have a, um, let's see, we need to show B. Print B, we have a buffer, it has a fixed length. And uh, actually, let's go backtrace. That's what we're running. No, hmm. It's been optimized out. Usually, um, we would see the, the mem copy uh, failed, but uh, here, here we are. Um, anyway, we, we got a bounds violation trying to execute the buffer overflow. Um, and then, let's go look at the pointer type confusion. So, so here's a, a, another example of Cherry and the uh, monotonicity constraints in particular. Um, so in this example, uh, we have a union of a pointer and an integer. Um, we assign a pointer to the, uh, to the pointer value in it, and then we increment the integer. Um, now, because of the way they're laid out, the integer is the, uh, is the same as the address, um, so it looked, so we would attempt to, in, in, to uh, uh, increment that pointer um, using an integer instruction rather than a, a cherry constru construction. So now let's, uh, let's see how we do that. Now, so now, now we have a cherry production fault. Um, and if we take a look at the pointer, so print new dot we'll notice that it says it's invalid. And that is because the integer operation on the capability um, resulted in the tag being cleared. So you can't use this capability anymore. So when we tried to dereference it, it didn't work. Um, and this is one of the reasons, in fact, why, um, you know, I was alluding that it's often hard to find demonstrations. Well, so we can, we can defeat buffer overflows. We can also defeat these kind of, even if the buffer overflow existed, um, if you were doing a classic stack overflow and 
and trying to smash the return address, you wrote a bunch of bytes over it, and now it's not tagged anyway. So even if you knew what to put there, it wouldn't matter. Um, you, you, now, you now require an, atta an attacker now has to have some ability to mint interesting capabilities um, and put them in the right place. So the gadgets they need are much more complex, um, and we, 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 we make things just generally difficult for them. So let's go next. I'm going to pull on that bit here. And now I'm going to let John come up and talk about our idea for bringing Cherry into FreeBSD in FreeBSD 16. All right, so that's a little bit about Cherry and what it does. Um, but part of the reason that we wanted to talk to you guys today, or you all, um, is to talk about what does it make sense and, and about actually bringing Cherry support into FreeBSD proper. Currently, we maintain a downstream fork called CherryBSD, uh, but at some point, it's going to make sense to pull this up into FreeBSD itself. And we think the right time to do that is probably aiming for before FreeBSD 16 is released. So it's a variable timeline, but that's kind of what we think. Um, so why do we think that FreeBSD 16 might be a good target time to pursue this? Uh, first of all, uh, Cherry is now a thing which has been proven to work across multiple architectures. We started on MIPS. We've abandoned that because MIPS. Um, but it now has been, we've defined it for RISC-V um, and ARM has built their Morello prototype architecture. In particular on RISC-V, there's a lot of interest outside of just academia. Um, there are currently efforts underway to define Cherry as an upstream ratified standard to RISC-V and this is not driven just by folks at Cambridge. There's commercial interest in uh, a couple of companies including Codacip who's in the process of building a 64-bit design that will incorporate Cherry. Um, as well as SCI Semiconductor, um, whose some of their principals worked on a project called Chariot, which applies Cherry to a 32-bit version of RISC-V, kind of targeted more to microcontrollers. Um, but it is coming, and it is going to ship at some point in the not too distant future. Um, it's also true, uh, well, so that's what kind of gets to me motivation is the fact that RISC-V is going to ship. And in the current ecosystem of things that you're able to run on a Cherry processor, if you're not running an RTOS, CherryBSD is the most compelling general purpose operating system out there, the one that's most complete, that works with a pretty full stack. Um, I know one of the things in particular about the demo we're doing today on Morello Box um, is that actually the whole thing we're running, uh, this is Ocular from KDE that's presenting the PDF, and it's running as Cherry C, so full memory space graphical stack with, uh, is this Wayland or Xord? I think, well, they both work because we use Xord for SCDM. Um, but a fully built graphical stack with QT and all sorts of things that all work when compiled for Cherry. Um, so CherryBSD is like the, 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 uh, the thing that's viable. And so as a result, uh, because we are a fork of FreeBSD, that means FreeBSD is in a very good position to be kind of the uh, best first of breed for supporting Cherry. If we take advantage of that opportunity soon, because as there is in, in industrial interest in Cherry, other systems, mostly Linux, are going to catch up. There will be a Cherry Linux in the not too distant future. And so we have a window of opportunity where we can be first, but only if we take advantage of it. So if we're going to upstream, what do we mean by upstreaming? What do we plan to do? Um, so the thing that we think makes first, or makes sense to do first, is just kind of general support for Cherry as an architecture. Uh, so what does this mean? This means the ability to have what we call pure capability, where all the pointers are capabilities, both in a kernel and a user, a user state. Um, one of the things that this, so that requires just general changes, kind of the way you might think about having a new architecture. Not quite as bad as 64-bit versus 32-bit, but not about somewhat similar order of changes to support the kind of architecture variant. We also have a compatibility layer called FreeBSD64 which allows you to run legacy 64-bit applications that used to use integer pointers, kind of like on 64-bit architectures, we have FreeBSD32, so it's structured mostly similar to, similar to that. Um, the things that we think make sense to target in terms of architectures for upstreaming is the standardized Cherry RISC-V. So right now we have the kind of internal version we developed at Cambridge for research. Um, and it's not quite exactly the same thing that will land as the ratified standard. And whatever ends up being ratified, that's what's going to make sense to upstream. 
Uh, one of the things that goes along with that, uh, of course, if you haven't already asked yourself, is tool chains. Um, and we anticipate that uh, support for standardized Cherry Risk V is going to make it into upstream LLVM, along with kind of the general support for Cherry as a notion that's needed in LLVM to support that. Uh, we don't know exactly the timeline for that, if in terms of will that land in time for FreeBSD 16 or not, but eventually we will be able to use an entry toolchain to support, to support Cherry Risk V. Um, on the other hand, we also think that at least in the near term, it makes sense to support Morello. Now, Morello is not a part of ARM's architecture that they're committed to supporting in the future as a standard extension. Uh, it is a one-off demonstrator, but it is also, in terms of physical sand, the most practical Cherry instance to use because it's a real processor that runs at 2 point whatever gigahertz and there's you know, four CPUs in a package, um, which is much nicer than using emulated things on the FPGA or even the early RISC-V designs are not gonna be quite that, that beefy, right? You, they might be looking at something that's more like a Raspberry Pi. So I think for near-term use, uh, Morello Box is gonna be the most comfortable experience for folks to get used to. Um, but some one caveats about that is because it is a kind of demonstrator fork of ARM's architecture, there's not gonna be support for Morello in an upstream tool chain, and supporting that architecture is going to require it to be uh, using an external tool chain. Also, we, in our, it's our belief that Morello support would be a tier three thing, because if ARM decides to ship a real Cherry extension in the future, it will use different opcodes, and it will be a hard like ABI brick and so forth. Uh, but in terms of the source code, we'll be able to reuse most of that, we believe. Um, but we wouldn't guarantee binary compatibility across such a change. And tier three is the get out of jail card to let us do that. Um, another thing that goes along, a lot of what we talk about here is, deals with user space, but it is true that, as I alluded to KDE running, we have some patches support that will also be something we would like to upstream in parallel with moving things up to source. Um, so phase one gets us basically a working Cherry architecture. It would allow you to run spatial safe, uh, spatially safe C on, um, like for example, Morello box with a full desktop stack and so forth. But there are things beyond that, um, some of whom we'll talk about later, that we think might make sense to do in later phases. And part of the reason we want to do later phases is we know this is going to be a big ball of mud to review. Um, we are well acquainted with how big the ball of mud is. Um, and to the extent that we can make phase one as small as we can to make it at least somewhat digestible, uh, we want to defer other changes that happen to later phases. And some of these we'll talk about more, um, something called sub-object bounds uh, and heap temporal safety that Mark's going to talk about, we think are additional phases. And other things that we are continuing to research on like compartmentalization as they continue to mature and reach production grade, then we think those will make sense to upstream. So, what are some things we aren't upstreaming? If you go to GitHub and you figure out the right incantation of branch names to look at our diff, it is huge. And a lot of the things in that diff are kind of ugly and we know that it's ugly because we worked on it. Um, and some of that is a product of the fact that uh, Cherry has been a thing that has been developed over a long period of time. Are we up to 15 years at least, something like that? Approaching 15 years? That's a lot of development. And we've had to learn a lot of things. Uh, early days before I started working on Cherry, we didn't have a compiler that could compile what we call Cherry C, and things had to be done by hand when you wanted to manipulate capabilities. And so over time, uh, Cherry VST has evolved as our tool chain and our kind of familiarity and knowledge of the architecture has evolved. Um, and so we've learned some things, uh, but we have some artifacts of kind of the ways we've done things in the past. So one big one of those, uh, Brooks alluded to, is that we started off not being able to use full Cherry C in the kernel. We allowed user space pointers to be capabilities so we could enforce spatial safety on user space and, on, and honored that when arguments were passed to our system calls, but we didn't do it in the kernel right away and that allowed us to have a kernel that ran so we could focus on doing research in user space because it's a lot easier to change things when you have a working kernel under you and you can still debug things. Um, but that entails supporting the fact that user pointers are a different size and shape than kernel pointers requires a lot of diff. Uh, and while those have been useful for us in our development, we don't think any of that makes sense to upstream. And in fact, our rough estimate is somewhere between a half and three quarters of all the patches we have in the kernel are to support this alternate kind of ABI for the kernel where it's a, where it's a mix. And for upstreaming just a pure capability kernel, we won't need any of that. And then it will be a lot more straightforward. So, we're, so a lot of things you might see in the diff are not going to come upstream. So don't look straight at the diff and get scared. Um, there's also some things in our kernel either, or our diff rather, some of them are 
maybe vestiges of things they haven't fully purged. Um, I'm sure we have some of those. There's definitely things we have purged, but we probably missed some spots. And then also, we, we are doing ongoing active research into things. And so some of the things we have in our tree are perhaps less mature than others. And so we're not planning to upstream things that are still kind of actively under research and we're still, still figuring out how they will work or if they will work. So what does it look like um, kind of now with you thinking, if you're kind of a FreeBSD developer, what does it look like to have a tree architecture in the tree? What are some of the implications? So one of the things Brooks already alluded to is that for each platform you end up with a new machine arc. And so we basically take the base machine arc and we add a C suffix. So ARC 64C or RISC V 64C, that denotes the kind of terrified version of an architecture. Um, so it, just like 64 and 32 have different machine arcs, the same is true with Cherry. It's kind of like a new class of, of, of CPU architectures. Um, so we have a whole new kind of re, uh, concept of ABIs. Today in FreeBSD, our architectures are generally split into two camps. We have 32-bit architectures where integer longs and pointers are all the same size, and uh, LP64s are 64-bit architectures where our longs and pointers are 64-bit. Then Cherry is a new version of that. So in Cherry, your long is still 64-bit, but your pointers are not. There's this 128, really 129-bit thing. So it, you have to think about uh, kind of a whole new top-level class of sizes are. Um, and we actually, we have a reference, you can follow that link. Uh, we've patched the ARC.7 man page in CherryBSD to add these new architectures and kind of update some of the tables to reflect the different properties of Cherry architectures compared to existing ISAs. In terms of C types that we use in, our, in the base system, um, we have some new types and we have some types that maybe have somewhat different semantics than you might be used to. So UNT pointer T has to be able to round trip a pointer. That's what C says. So UNT pointer T in Cherry is a capability, meaning it's got a, the one bit tag on the side and it has the upper word of metadata, which means it's not just an int. So it's not just a plain int. Um, it is bigger than an int. So for example, it has more bits than a UNT max T because a UNT max T is only designed to hold scalar types, like in, which are integers. Um, but there's sometimes when you don't need a pointer, you need an address uh, for certain things. And so we had a new kind of base type called pointer adder T, which is when I want to work with just an address of a thing and not necessarily if I need the full pointer of a thing so that we can kind of distinguish when you want to deal with one of those use cases versus the other. Um, so where are some places in the tree that this kind of distinction where pointers and addresses are different types kind of we run into? So elf adder in places like the runtime linker um, we will, or the way we handle relocations in the, in the kernel, for example, we like to basically assume we can convert elf adders into pointers into lots of places, and we can no longer do that in Cherry. So we have to change them either to be UN pointer T or to be a real pointer to deal with. Things like uh, TLS allocation is another place where we have a bunch of diffs and RTLDs that basically are dealing with this fact that, we, that elf adder is an address, not a pointer. Um, similarly, in the kernel, we have this wonderful type called VM offset T for mock that we use all over the place. Um, and VM offset T, uh, we treat as an address, and so there are some places where we need to change those to be a pointer. So currently in CherryBSD, we've introduced a new type for VM pointer T, which is an alias of UNT pointer T in effect, um, and patched various places to use that when they actually mean a, a pointer that the kernel is going to treat as a pointer. So aside from types, what are a few other kind of C idioms you may be used to using in FreeBSD that get spelled a little differently or they have slightly different semantics when operating in a Cherry context compared to a traditional architecture? Um, so one is that their Cherry capabilities have a tag, as Brooks alluded to, that decide when, how do we decide when a capability is valid, you can still use it to reference memory versus when it's not. It's been corrupted in some way or someone's tried to inject one over the network or something crazy. Um, so we have a notion of when do you need to keep tags and when do you maybe explicitly want to throw them away because you're handing memory off to somebody you don't trust and so you want to throw the tags away, which means that in some APIs we have to be aware of when do we want to keep a tag around and when do we not. So, so memcopy preserves tags, I meaning if you copy some structure or something that has pointers inside of it, in the destination copy the pointers still work because if you broke memcopy then C would be broken. <coughs> so we have to keep copying pointers work. But there are times when you may want to do a memory copy where you know it's just scalar data or you know that the pointers you copy you want to not work and whoever you're handing the pointers off to. So we have an extension of memcopy called memcopy nocap 
that will strip tag to the destination buffer of any pointers that it copies. Uh, and then we have a couple of similar changes to other kernel-specific APIs. So copy in and copy out and kind of that family of, of APIs for dealing with user memory, they have extensions to deal with capabilities. So you can choose when you're copying a structure in from user space whether or not you believe the structure should have pointers or not. And if it shouldn't have pointers, then you might, you'll just use copy in. But if you actually need pointers because you're copying in some struct that has nested pointers you're going to chase, then you'll have, you have to change your code to use copy and cap to say I want you to preserve those tags because I'm getting a pointer, I mean it, I'm aware. Um, we have, for example, there, there, and there are, this isn't an exhaustive list, um, but some other types of things. Uh, for UIO move, there are a few cases, and judgy cam things, where UIO move insists on copying in blocks of things that have pointers inside of them. So, and also there's some ptrace cases where this happens, if I remember correctly. So we have a, a way when you are constructing a UIO that you can say, I don't want to just do a read or a write, I want to do a read or a write that preserves tags. Um, and then another ball of mud is Ioctl. So we have the sad face because we cry about Ioctl in many ways. Um, conceivably, we could find a scheme where we tag Ioctls to say this one has pointers or not, but we haven't done that yet, and so currently Ioctls just always preserve capabilities in the initial copy in that they do and copy out. Some other things that you have to deal with when you're working with uh, Cherry um, is Cherry pointers, the way tags work is tags are only valid on kind of a, a pointer aligned boundary. So Cherry capabilities have to be stored on a, a, like an aligned boundary of a pointer um, for, the, for the tag to still work. So this means you have to take that into effect, that uh, the compiler may need to insert um, extra padding than it would otherwise because you misaligned a pointer in a struct of some sort and the compiler is going to fix that, but you have to cope with that. Uh, if you've written your own, okay, yeah, written your own allocator and you um, have to take into account the maximum alignment you have to do, which now we have a new type in C, max align T that handles that. But a lot of code, older code has their own max align T and they don't have a pointer in the union they use to define max align T and so it doesn't work on Cherry and we don't always end up with, these end up with misaligned pointers that don't work. Pointers are also bigger and that comes at a cost. Um, like that adds overhead just like it did for 64 to 32 bit. Um, and you, you have to be intentional about um, using types that really are, for example, you have pointer T. Uh, I kind of alluded to this when we talked about elf adder um, or VM offset T or perhaps long, other types that on our current architectures, they actually will work to hold a pointer, but they won't in Cherry. Another example of this is it's a common theme in some things like ZFS and some other places that the way you solve the 64 versus 32 bit problem is you just use a UNT 64T because that's big enough for pointers and all your structures that you pass around and ioctals and system call arguments and things because that's big enough to hold a pointer everywhere except on Cherry where it's not. Um, so those are some of the things you kind of may have to deal with when looking at, at kind of Cherry in FreeBSD context. <coughs> so um, one more kind of, I think this is the last topic I have to cover. Um, so in, in phase one, we talked about just having kind of base Cherry support. But one of the things that Cherry allows us to do is if you're willing to kind of be, a, break a little bit more of C and make and, and inquire a little more care, you can kind of do some more creative things. And one of the things we've played with that you can do to gain a little more protection is something called sub object bounds, which is the ability at runtime for the compiler to decide to narrow bounds to a member of a structure or union or perhaps a, an element of an array instead of the whole thing. Um, and this can be some nice properties. So uh, Brooke showed an example here where we have a structure and it has a char array right next to a pointer for a, a function. So in a traditional architecture, if you over overflowed the char array, you would get to overwrite a pointer and maybe retrieve arbitrary code execution because now you can redirect the pointer to where you want to go when you override the array. Um, and in base cherry, we're going to apply the bounds to the whole struct, struct foo. So we also don't protect against that. I mean, we protect against that because you can't, when you do the overflow, and it's going to be untagged. And so you'll die because the pointer you write is corrupted. But we can't prevent you from writing to the pointer necessarily. But if we turn on subobject bounds, then if you pass, for example, foo data as an argument to memcopy, the pointer that memcopy gets inside is actually constrained to the array. And you can't overflow out of the array into adjacent things in the structure, um, which is the example that uh, Brooks has here in update foo. So one of the things we have done in Cherry BSD is we have 
played with this a little bit in some user space components, but it does break quite a few things because there are things in C that want to kind of narrow bounds and come back later. In particular, you can think of uh, the way you would do oof in C where you might embed a base class as a structure member in a larger structure in a, sub, in a superclass or a subclass. And then when you want to do the downcast, you're expanding your bounds back out again. And that doesn't work if you turn this on. But we have found that we've been able to actually do this in the kernel and have it work. Um, we do have to do some annotations, but we have some ways the compiler can tell you. For example, if you use container of to kind of deal with your downcast, the compiler will warn you at compile time if you haven't added the annotation to the right field to make sure we don't narrow bounds uh, when you do the upcast. So this is something that we think uh, might be something we could upstream as our phase two, and it gives you an extra layer of protection that you can't get with things like address sanitizer. Um, and this may be a, a way of stretching C even more. All right, so the next one, I'll, I'll not preview it, I think goes to Mark. So I'll hand over to Mark. Another, another feature that Cherry enables uh, with, with some rotational assistance from our operating system is uh, heap control and safety. Uh, so in the code example that I gave in the top left, um, I, you know, there's pretty routine C programming bugs that can have security implications if this pointer to a struct foo is allocated as some other type of structure um, before that increment happens. So at that point, we have a pointer, a, a dangling pointer that is now being used for something else. And uh, these kinds of bugs can, can have security implications, which in fact are quite common. Um, this is much so as buffer overflows, which we saw are mitigated by uh, Cherry C's basic safety guarantees. Um, so it turns out that with some machinery, again from the operating system, uh, it's possible to mitigate these types of bugs as well. Um, so to think about a few strategies for this, or present a couple of you know, examples, um, one strategy for avoiding these kinds of bugs is to just never free memory. If free is a no-op, you leak all your memory, and you never have a new factor free, and it causes um, security breach. So that works. Um, obviously, it doesn't work very well for long-lived tokens. Uh, so the other thing you can do in Cherry is basically scan a process's whole address space. You can look at every single piece of memory that's mapped into it from the kernel, and for each 16-byte aligned chunk, see if there's a capability tag associated with it. And so one thing you could also do is after calling free, scan all of your memory, look for pointers into the point into the buffer that you're freeing and clear the tags on all of them. And then free returns and you keep going. And then after that, this attempt to increment A will just crash because it might have dereferenced a pointer that doesn't have a tag associated with it. And that works too, um, but it's very expensive. So in uh, Cherry BSD, what we do is basically take a second approach and try to amortize it across uh, a whole bunch of allocations. So the key property that we're trying to preserve is that, you know, use after freeze are still possible in the sense that, you know, you can dereference a pointer after you freed it, um, and it might work or it might crash, but uh, you can at least guarantee that that buffer won't have been reallocated for some other purpose. So in particular, we distinguish between use after reallocation, in which, you know, a dangling pointer is used to access memory after that memory has been reallocated for some other purpose uh, versus use after free, which is just, uh, you know, accessing a pointer to a buffer that's been free. Uh, so use after freeze are still possible. They won't necessarily crash your program, but we can turn use after reallocation into a deterministic crash instead of a potential security hole. So like I said, the approach is to basically scan all of memory, look for pointers, into buffers that have been freed and clear the tags. So to do that, uh, there's some support required in the memory allocator as well. So normally a buffer has you know, one of two states. Uh, it's either free or it's in use. Uh, so in Cherry BSD, uh, there's a third state, the quarantine state. So when freeing a buffer, what we want to do before reusing it is make sure that there's no dangling pointers that reference that buffer anywhere in the process's memory in its 
Uh, we had red registers, red registers. Uh, nowhere in the kernel, maybe the kernel's cache and pointers. Basically, looking through all of those possible places where uh, a big old pointer can be squirreled away and clearing all those cache. At that point, we have space to reuse all of those buffers because the worst that's gonna happen is you're gonna get a deterministic crash. Uh, so there's quite a lot of bits that are required to make this work. Um, it doesn't come for free, like w with, with the you know, notion of cherry capability, like you have a spatial safety. It, it, there's, there's some extra support required, as I said, in the memory allocator. So the actual pieces I've kind of tried to enumerate on the left side. Uh, so in Cherry BSD, we have something called MRS, which is uh, malloc replication shim, which is a layer that interposes between uh, you know, application code and malloc and the rest of the other memory allocation functions. So what it does when it receives, uh, like when, when a pointer has been freed, a pointer to a buffer has been freed, rather than freeing it to the underlying allocator, that pointer goes into uh, a basically a linked list of quarantined buffers. And at some point when the amount of quarantine memory grows large enough, we use uh, a system call called cherry revoke to initiate that revocation pass that I, that I described, wherein we scan all of memory, clear tags to, to uh, quarantined memory. Uh, so as you can probably imagine, oh, Scanning everything is pretty slow. Uh, and so in the interest of, you know, minimizing, mm, let's just take a step back. There's been a few different designs which, which solve this problem, but I think that the paramount, you know, consideration is application latency. If free suddenly, you know, most of the time takes a few microseconds and then suddenly starts taking half a second in order to complete because in the background it's doing a big scan of memory, um, you know, that's, that's not very good. So successive designs with this key temporal safety mechanism have aimed to reduce that latency. Uh, so in particular, we have the system call which does background scanning, but we also do scanning in the foreground. So once you start a revocation, once you start trying to do clear dangling pointers to quarantine memory, uh, another thing that happens is that all attempts to load a quarantine, or uh, sorry, attempts to load a uh, capability into a register will trigger a fault page fault into the kernel. Uh, and what happens there is we can, when, when handling that fault, check, check the memory that's gonna be accessed and preemptively revoke any pointers in there. So scanning a single page versus a file history, it's much cheaper. And we only have to do it once in processing a particular uh, page uh, per, per revocation pass. Uh, there's also, and, and so as I mentioned, uh, the memory allocator maintains this quarantine state. It also exports, it maintains a bitmap which it shares with the kernel. So you have effectively one bit for every 16 byte chunk in the programmed address space. So one bit for every 128 bits of virtual address space. So less than 1% virtual memory overhead. And a lot of that never actually gets allocated because most, proce most processes don't use much of the, uh, or they don't use a significant fraction of the available address space. So there's a bit of memory overhead there, but small and basically in line with you know, traditional metadata allocator over or traditional allocator metadata overhead uh, so there's yeah we we'll, we'll call the load side revoker where processes which access which load capabilities into registers clear them by tapping into the kernel there's a background scan which makes sure that everything else gets cleared uh, and to enable that we have a few extra extensions to page table entries which basically reflect whether a given page or a given virtual virtual uh, page has been scanned or not. Uh, and certain knobs that you, you can use to control MRS. So historically that background scan triggered by the cherry revoke system call was synchronous. So it's very expensive, um, but we've recently made it asynchronous. So there's you know, things to, there's, there's environment variables and search controls which control that. Uh, I said in the very beginning, we could after every single free call scan all of memory, clear all of the dangling, or clear tags to all the dangling pointers, and it's actually possible to enable that. Because that does give you uh, deterministic uh, use after, use after read uh, checking. Because again, in this example, it's possible for that uh, access at the end to be crap, or it might just access memory that's still in quarantine. 
which case we don't necessarily detect it. And finally, there's a few cases to handle what are called kernel horrors, where again, you know, a process might have a capability that's stashed somewhere in the kernel in some state that's maintained by the kernel. So case view is probably the easiest example of this. When you call kevent, uh, you fill out a structure, a struct struct kevent, and there's room in there for user space to stash a pointer. So, you know, it's possible that user space would stash a dangling pointer into a kevent, call into the kernel, scrub it from its own address space. Well, in order for the full mechanism to work, kvbc also needs to scan all those k events. And there's quite a few, not, there's, there's a number of different kernel interfaces which let you do that. So there's some glue, uh, which, which connects the carry revoke system calls to those different subsystems. And uh, there's, there's tags for that interface. So I'll just take a quick demo of this. Slightly more elaborate example, um, but basically the same as what we do in the slides. Um, if we allocate uh, a pointer as character, write some data to it, see the pointer, write to it again, and then call this special malloc revoke function, which is part of MRS, which effectively just does a synchronous revocation uh, before it returns. And so, and then right after that, we have a, uh, uh, a printf, which again accesses, references that pointer. And so after that malloc revoke call uh, returns, that access is guaranteed to trigger um, uh, a tag call because that pointer CP ought to have its tag cleared. Uh, it's possible also that the call or the, that the access immediately following the free would also fall, but uh, in our implementation, it's basically, you know, it, it depends on how, how frequently uh, revocations actually happen. So, one way or another, we expect to program C um, to default. And indeed it does. More specifically, you can see that it pops when accessing that that pointer following the malloc revoke call. So in particular, that, that use after free, immediately following the free call is not caught. Uh, but this one following revocation is, and that effectively miti mitigates those, those dangling pointers which we were saying about use, just because uh, you know, it's relatively innocuous to act as a pointer that points to freed memory. Um, it's still a bug, of, of course, but uh, those bugs turn into security vulnerabilities once that memory is read. Uh, so it's possible to enable a mode where free will effectively have the same semantics as malloc revoke, but that's too expensive to enable by default. I believe, uh, I think Cisco has actually booted a system with that enabled and it's, it's, it's still usable, it's just, it's a bit too slow, but not quite, not to the point where it's catatonic, it's still good stuff. Section. Oh yeah. On uh, compartmentalization. I will talk briefly now about some ongoing, some very much in progress work on. Uh, fine grained compartmentalization. So one of the promises of Cherry is that by building on top of the uh, memory safety um, that Cherry provides, we can create um, extremely fine grained compartments with extremely fast context switching. Um, the intuition behind this um, is that the portion of memory in your process address space that you can reach is the transitive closure of your register set. So 
all the capabilities in your register set can reach some other capabilities or can, can reach into memory. That memory may have capabilities in it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that doesn't have to be everything in your address space. So you can, with, the, with a tiny bit of hardware assistance to, to enable domain switching, um, switch between compartments that can access different data um, within a process. And you don't have to enter the kernel. You get to share your TLB. Um, you're, it, it's just much more efficient. So we've done a number of prototypes, but the most recent thing that we've been working on um, started out as library-based compartmentalization. In the uh, library-based compartmentalization model, we take the, we start with the hypothesis that the software engineering boundaries for libraries are a sensible security boundary. Um, on a future slide, I'll tell you that's not true, but it's a pretty good approximation, and it's how the code's already cut up, because one of the problems with compartmentalization in the past has been that it's a lot of work to take a program and sort of rip it into pieces uh, to do different things. So we see it only in the most critical applications with the highest attack surface. We see it in open SSH with privilege separation. We see it in Chromium, Firefox, Safari, um, some other cases, um, you know, Mac OS has pulled, Mac OS and iOS have pulled bits out um, and stuck them in processes because that's all you got. But you can only do it when it's really critical and when the performance impact is small. Um, because if the performance impact is huge, it doesn't matter how critical it is because no one will use it. Um, so with where, where what we're doing here is we're, we have, <coughs> have a demonstration here of library-based compartmentalization. Um, and I'll give you a quick glimpse at what that means. So, So we have this uh, ocular process here. Um, Um, so, so here I've, I've used the, the uh, C18N, which is short for compartmentalization, because that's too long to type and I misspell it half the time anyway, so it'd be really bad. Um, and uh, it is, uh, so we're showing here of interest, the, uh, this is the ocular that, that I was displaying the PDFs in. There are 147 compartments, um, and they're also, due to threading and whatnot, there are 100 and there are 1,200 stacks, separated stacks for different different uh, different threads. Um, let's see. Let's do the more interesting demo. Here's a, here's our list of compartments. We've got the runtime linker. We've got a couple libraries uh, grouped into the uh, trusted computing base (TCB). Um, there's the uh, unwinder, and then the program, and then a gazillion KDE libraries. Um, the other thing, I think that Robert likes to do in his demos, Let's set a breakpoint on PNG. There we go. We hit dump. I caused it to, to, to render a PNG, and now we are at a breakpoint, or no, we have set a breakpoint. Oops, I set a lot of breakpoints, that's right. Now, let's continue, and let's pop up Ocular and move it around, or move it or something, and then, hmm. Trigger 
doing today? No. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Uh, here we go. We hit one. Now, backtrace. Um, the, uh, all the GDE fun is uh, going to work. And if you look down near the bottom, you'll see a cross compartment call here <laughs> um, where we have called from one to the, to the next. And there's another one here. So you can see we're, we're isolating each of these libraries um, in its own uh, sandbox. And so yeah, that's that. Let's get out of, ooh, that'll be bad. So oops, let that run again. So yeah, that's, that's sort of the quick and dirty uh, demo. And uh, let's go back to the last bit of the presentation. So that's library compartmentalization. As I said, you know, the initial hypothesis is that the software engineering boundaries are sensible security boundaries. Um, there's some obvious cases where that isn't true. For instance, if we think about um, libc, libc does all sorts of things. Um, you know, it has, has a thousand odd so symbols. It, uh, has surprise, you know, printf can trigger DL open um, to uh, load internationalization uh, bits, localization bits, and, uh, and whatnot. And yet it also holds capabilities that can access all the heap memory in the process because it has capabilities for every capability returned by MMAP to malloc. So we'd like to keep those well isolated. So we'd like to, for instance, be able to put a compartment around malloc. Um, so one of the things we have work in progress um, is to add compartments within libraries. Um, so there's a bit of linking change, which you can pester John about. Uh, John's working on it, uh, on one of our two efforts. Uh, but uh, the idea is to be able to, based on a policy, group code and data together within libraries, sort of like create little sub-libraries. Um, and to add, and then adding per component, got some PLTs so they can be compartmentalized. And so we're gonna go from, you know, 150 compartments to who knows how many. Um, the, the DARPA CPM program, that uh, uh, compartmentalization and privilege management program that uh, uh, we're currently working on um, has groups working on automated compartmentalization, discovering where those compartment boundaries should be. And so we'll see where we get in terms of total number, certainly thousands or tens of thousands probably. Um, it's worth noting, I don't remember the command sequence uh, uh, that to, to do it, but you can see in, in the system with PMC stat that if you're running with all the system compartmentalized, um, we can take, we are, we are taking on the order of a million compartment transa transactions per second, and from a user perspective, there is no impact. Um, and that's just <coughs> completely inconceivable with current process-based compartmentalization technology. So this is stuff that is very much research, um, what, you know, we, we sometimes turn compartmentalization on for the whole systems and sometimes we're scared and we don't, um, but, uh, for, for a demo or something, but, uh, we're getting, we're getting close there and it's something we hope to bring to FreeBSD eventually, but it's definitely well down the road. Um, it, it depends on the spatial safety and on heap temporal safety, um, and probably some more enhancements to that, uh, that heap temporal safety, uh, that we haven't implemented yet. So some, some work, work there still to be done. So um, I'd like to invite you to get your hands dirty with Cherry if you're interested. Um, we have cherrybsd.org. You can learn about CherryBSD. Um, it's also as an installer if you get yourself a Merlot box. Um, you can look in CherryBSD ports for the sort of changes we've made. Um, I will caution you that the current port's pretty over a year out of date. Um, we'll get caught up soon, hopefully. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's been, we've had other priorities. Um, however, the Cherry BSD ports collection that is there is what built all the software that's running on the system. So we have you know, our modified LLVM and Clang, which is not a pure capability program yet, um, but the, the PDF viewer, KDE, um, and all those bits are pure capability. Um, there you can download Cherry Build, a giant and scary ball of Python, um, but the important thing about it is it lets you build CherryBSD, the compiler, QEMU, GDB, 
all that good stuff, all from one command. Um, and you can do that on FreeBSD, on your Mac, on Alexa.com. Um, and more or less, it's one command. Um, there is a little link here to the uh, dsdb.tech website. This is a UKRI-funded uh, project that is what funded Morello. Um, and you can request a board for your company if you're interested in, uh, in using Cherry at your company or exploring it. Um, just have to answer some questions and they will send it to you. You don't have to be a, a UK company. Um, it's definitely possible to get them outside. And then uh, links to our very, very preliminary taken off of a whiteboard document, uh, upstreaming tasks list for uh, FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. Just trying to put together the list. Um, there is a selection of tasks there that does not require Cherry at all. Um, probably requires a bit of knowledge of Cherry, um, but some cleanups and refactoring that will help help the process along. So that's, that's what I've got. Um, if anyone has questions uh, for any of us, I can hand out the mics if Oh yeah, you have to take it out of this, take the thing off this top and get it in there. <laughs> you have to take it up to that hole, it slides out, and there's a button in the bottom. So at this point, uh, between the hardware and the software, uh, roughly what I is the overhead of the cherry protections for each of various workloads? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a complicated answer. It depends on what kind of workload you're running. Uh, so there will be workloads where you see essentially no overhead. Um, there will be workloads, most of them probably fall in the sort of sub five, maybe a little over 5% um, cycle overhead. If you're running a particularly point of dense workload, then you can expect to see uh, a higher overhead just from the additional memory pressure uh, induced by the pointer size. Um, so for example, language runtimes would probably be something that are disproportionately affected. Um, I think those are something that we've not properly benchmarked so far. Um, the thing we focused on historically has been spec CPU 2006. Uh, and for that, we see, or we estimate based on numbers from Morello that it's about two to three percent is probably achievable as a mean across the benchmarks for that suite. Um, but it's gonna be very workload dependent. Um, if you get a Morello board and you start benchmarking on it, there are a lot of caveats for the implementation on Morello specifically. Um, we have a report on this, um, but due to various you know, constraints in the timeline of the development, uh, the hardware doesn't quite have the performance one might expect for something that's production ready. So you can see disproportionate overheads there as well. Um, but we've been able to, to extrapolate for more uh, realistic uh, numbers on that. A quick question about the upstreaming to the FreeBSD project. So uh, as of the FreeBSD 16, uh, we will have a new uh, ABI uh, called uh, ABI for the so Cherry architecture. So that does it mean uh, uh, we have uh, uh, same change for the uh, non-Cherry platform or just for the Cherry supported platform? We will have a... Uh, So there are certainly code changes that are common 
or changes that affect parts of the code that aren't specific to a cherry architecture. Mm -hmm. um, but in some cases, you're still on the type differently in a way that doesn't matter on a non-cherry architecture. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you use, if we decide to upstream VM pointer T um, in places instead of VM offset T, those types are the same type on a non-cherry architecture, so it doesn't mean anything for non-cherry mm -hmm. architectures, but it will be a change in the source code. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few places, Brooks mentioned one when he talked about UIOs. There are a few places in the kernel where we have um, an allocation. We do a couple of these in early startup where we will allocate two different things that are kind of very different sizes, but we'll do one giant allocation that has both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of problematic for Cherry to kind of have a nice pointer that's representative and doesn't require excessive padding. Um, mm -hmm. Where we've basically, there are two separate objects anyway, and e eventually even get stored as two separate pointers in the kernel. Um, and we'll actually do two separate allocations during startup instead of one. Mm -hmm. But those type of things are not going to be meaningful or measurable difference-wise on non-cherry architectures. And it's like a few lines of code to change something that instead of one big grab in pages, you grab first, you know, X and then N minus X mm -hmm. two lines later. Um, but I can't think of any large scale changes that will really impact non-cherry architectures in, a, in a, a visible way or performant way that you would be able to measure or observe. So, so at the source code level, we will have uh, as primitive uh, new primitive for Cherry on even on the non Cherry platform, right? It will be a uh, non is, non op or something. It is like true that, that, that the, uh, we mentioned earlier, or Brooks mentioned that we have compiler intrinsics for when you need to do things specifically to a Cherry mm -hmm. capability, such as when you're inside an allocator like malloc and you want to, you need to narrow the bounds on the bigger pointer from MMAP or something to the smaller point you're gonna to return to your caller so they have narrow bounds. That requires a line of C. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a stub that compiles to nothing on non tree architectures, but it will mm -hmm. be a source code visible change that we do need to, to honor things like bounds in some places. Um, like uh, inside the kernel, uh, vmem is a thing we currently use to manage address spaces for memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and vmem inside of CherryBSD needs to be aware of capabilities, both that it needs to be able to narrow bounds when necessary, but understanding the padding and alignment requirements mm -hmm. so that if a VMIM is doing an address space work that's going to be used for capabilities, because some of them aren't for device drivers and things, we have a flag to say, well, then you need to take into account whatever padding and alignment you need to do. So when you're doing allocation, maybe you need to line it, uh, round the size up a bit bigger, make sure it's suitably aligned that the point of your return is valid and doesn't alias anything else around mm -hmm. you. So there are some changes um, in a few places for that. Um, but in many cases, I don't know that they will impact non tree architectures. It's certainly not performance, but it's even not too much in code. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you'll have a line in something like KVA alloc, maybe it needs to set bounds if it doesn't already get it from VMIM. Um, but you're not gonna, it's not all over the place actually. Mm -hmm. Even in uh, application stacks, you tend to change the internals of malloc or the internals of maybe run the runtime linker because you have new relocations to deal with but you don't have to change things that call malloc. Mm -hmm. Things that call malloc just get a pointer and they're happy. And the same thing is true in the kernel. Now, one of the things we are looking at maybe changing upstream, I've done some of it already in some changes recently, is there are places where we like to use integer types like VM offset T when we really need a pointer. Um, and then in fact, we actually have to do a bunch of casts. Mm -hmm. So I think recently I changed some PMAP things. I don't know if I have streamed them yet, like PMAP map dev, I think is one I changed recently where Traditionally, that returned a VM offset T, and so everybody immediately cast that to a pointer in all the calling code, and then when you wanted to call PMAP map dev, like on map dev, you had to take your pointer and cast it back to a VM offset T. And when I changed those to be void star instead, what really happened is we got to rip a whole bunch of casts throughout code in the kernel, which was just ultimately cleaner for everybody. Um, and I think in some cases, the changes that we will make as part of upstreaming will be more on the lines of that, that we're going to try to do things where maybe we're just a little bit cleaner about distinguishing when we actually mean pointers in the kernel rather than an integer that happens to look and be the same size and shape as a pointer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, FreeBSD 15.0 is going to happen sometime around November or December of 2025. Uh, 16 point, FreeBSD 16.0 release sometime around November or December of 27. So uh, when you say you're aiming for FreeBSD 16, do you mean uh, September of next year when we 
we, we have 16 current, or do you mean uh, summer of 27 just before we, we branch stable 16? So I, I don't hate you, Colin. We don't hate you collectively. So we're not going to do September of 2027. Um, so I think we talked about upstreaming this week quite a bit, and it kind of built out a roadmap of what we think it looks like and some kind of stages we can get to. Um, and certainly there's some cleanups, s changing some more things to use Voidstar in the kernel, for example, that we can do that are just are cleaner for everybody and we can do sooner, and we hope to do those sooner rather than later. I want to also, I think, it's useful for us because we, we talked a little bit about this notion of how we, we kind of evolved our kernel over time, and the fact that we did a hybrid kernel meant that we had to have a lot of diffs. And we actually have a bit of a research uh, question we want to answer for ourselves, which is, well, how bad would it be if you didn't do that? Like, or kind of like, how, what is the actual cost to terrify a kernel if you're just doing kind of the normal treat it like a new architecture thing? Um, and so to some extent, I think we're going to run the sci science experiment of having a Git branch where we kind of get it all up and running um, well before we upstream. And so we're going to be doing that much sooner than the timeline of 16. And it, it may not surprise me if we end up actually having some bits that make it into 15 perhaps, 15 at current, but not as a thing that gets released just because of how long it's probably going to take to get things like this reviewed in upstream. But I don't think we are at all planning on trying to cram it all in two months before the release. I think we are viewing the 16.0 is, we're trying to give ourselves enough of a runway that we have quite a bit of time to try to merge things up, and we know that we're not going to merge it all at once as one giant monotonous git com commit of doom. Um, so we're, we're trying to give ourselves enough runway to see how much we can split things up, what, what are the smallest possible things we can do um, that maybe even early on it doesn't all compile yet because you have part of the architecture and not some bits that come in later, for example. Um, we're trying to give ourselves enough room that maybe a lot of it might be there in 15, but not fully or something like that. But we're trying to say that we think we'll all be there in something you could actually have a releasable product that ships in 16. That's kind of our goal. Yeah, I, I would say we probably want to be in by, you know, 2020, the end of uh, 2026, um, realist, if we can manage it, um, certainly the basic functionality in by that time would be great. Um, uh, we also, we, ha we, have, we have the ability, for instance, to, um, for instance, focus on the kernel first, um, and you could run CherryBSD user space potentially, um, and we, we might do that. It's really gonna depend on who's available and how much time we have, uh, what, what, what exact strategy and how much parallelism we're willing to employ. Um, there are a bunch of like minor user space changes that for instance could come in at any time. Uh, for example, init uses Berkeley DB as an in-memory hash. Um, it aligns pointers at two bytes. Um, makes Cherry very cranky, so we have to replace that. Uh, there's a few other, you know, there's there's a bunch of other little fix-ups uh, we need to, we need to re replace our merge sort implementation, um, some other some other stuff that is a, like a separate task. And, and we one of the things we've broken out in that uh, GitHub project that I linked is the stuff that's not, that's like not really Cherry. Um, that's the, or, it's a, it's a requirement for Cherry, but it's just a change that doesn't require knowledge of Cherry. We could, we could definitely use some help on, on some of these things. Uh, we also, when, when I did uh, FreeBSD 64, um, I took the FreeBSD, it's all, it's all from, it derived from FreeBSD 32. Um, very little that's not, not just a straight up copy. Um, except that I, I did some refactoring and the amount of duplication offended me, so I made some changes to, to uh, you know, add another layer of indirection and have less duplicate code, but also uh, I didn't like the 3,000 odd line FreeBSD32 misc file, so I broke it up by subsystems. Um, it'd be nice to take that, do that to FreeBSD32 so that we could then copy that and splat FreeBSD64 on top of it and at least the history will look sort of sane. Uh, always tend to not so bad. So a bunch of bunch of things like that.
thought about ways on how to bypass this? Uh, way, ways to bypass Cherry? Yeah, like, you know, in PAC, um, there are ways uh, where there were um, issues with the compiler. Uh, if you, I'm just thinking about like, um, you know, it's really cool, but um, what is the, what is the threat model? Like what is, what are the ways you can think of bypassing this uh, as an attacker? So the, the, the compiler is part of the trusted computing base as is the runtime. Um, so, you know, malloc has to put correct bounds on things. The compiler has to, has to put correct bounds on things when it, passes a reference to an automatic variable or something like that. Um, but you have to be pretty wrong <laughs> uh, to, to, to get things wrong there. And also, unlike, say, PAC, Cherry is deterministic. Um, there is no, th there, there is no way, in at least the ARM architecture, um, to generate a sequence of instructions that creates a capability that has higher permissions. Um, and that is, that's a formally proven property of the architecture. Now, whether an implementation correctly implements that, that's a different question. Um, and there was a recent uh, nice study, um, was it, who did the chariot verification? Ox Oxford did a, did a verification of the chariot uh, design um, where they found a number of cases where the architecture wasn't correctly implemented in the microarchitecture, but they were able to find these things and fix them. Uh, Okay, and they have proved that it's fully correct now. Um, so that is that is within the realm of the possible. Um, and I think uh, within scope of certainly many customers. Um, is, is there um, the bounds which are kept in the pointer itself? Um, is that um, protected by the hardware itself? Or is it, I'm just thinking like if, if there is a weak link can, if. Is it still possible to like change the the upper uh, the upper 64 bit? Is that does the hardware allow you to like not change that at all? Um, if you write if you write bytes to the capability through an instruction that is not a capability manipulation instruction, the tag is clear in the okay. register. So if you if you Sorry. or in memory. And D may clear tags too. D may clears tags too, so you can't inject them over D may round trips for better or for worse. I think also your question actually is uh, there's probably a few PhDs in figuring out what, how do attackers respond to a cherry aware system and how do they do that? One of the things we run into in some prior DARPA programs um, resolving around evaluating security architectures and how they deal with CWEs is that their tests had buffer flows in them that we broke before they even got to the point of running their real test. Um, because it, it, it is quite different. I mean, it, we are not naive to think that this fixes all class of bugs. It's in, in part why we really have a lot of hope for compartmentalization and the fact that you can constrain the resources or memory address or however you want to think about it available to an attacker once you break into a compartment of a cherry system. And we're hoping that that is kind of the layer of depth of defense that will help protect it in the future of whatever unknown classes of attacks arise. Um, but I do think that it'll take a little while for attackers to adjust and figure out how do you respond to this when kind of the easy current low-level hanging fruit doesn't work anymore. Yeah, uh, the Microsoft uh, security response team did a um, did an analysis where basically they, or a, sort of a paper, pencil and paper analysis, where they basically chopped off different security, they, they said, okay, so what if this this part of Cherry wasn't there? What could we do? Um, and they went, went through that exercise and they, they have a published report on that of sort of what the various pieces are. Um, one of the things we changed in our architecture, we took a, an experimental feature um, called, that, we ca that are called sealed, sealed entry capabilities. Um, one of the features I didn't talk about is that you can seal a capability, which means any change to it clears the tag. Um, and with a sealed entry capability, the only thing you can do with it is use it as a, as a jump or call target. Um, and we used, one of the things they found is that in, in their study is that those made their life really hard. So we made those into a, into a, a non-experimental feature of the architecture as a result. Um, and they're used for all return address pointers. Um, and also we use them for all uh, p uh, functions in the dot. So you're, your vocabulary is quite restrictive. 
not to say there aren't ways to, you know, attack the RT, you know, people are going to want to attack RTLD and get those hi highly privileged capabilities and figure out how to, how to leverage that, but uh, you've got to do that. <laughs> Yeah, j just to check uh, the understanding, uh, and maybe it's kind of connected to the previous question. Uh, where are the tags actually stored? They are stored off ban, no, I guess. They, they, are, they are stored off to the side. Um, it depends. There's there's implementation choices, um, but they're not they're not addressable like the rest of of memory. The me either the memory control the memory controller hides them one way or another. You can you can put them. You can stripe your memory in 129 bits, and the memory controller does the right thing. You could also have a, a separate tag cache, uh, which is what we did initially. It was an a, a, a suitable approach for some types of microarchitecture. Um, it's I don't know how you make that decision because I'm not a microarchitect. I believe it's correct that Morello is currently the way we use it, storing them effectively in ECC bits, or what you might consider of think of as ECC bits. Um, and it's maintained, so the entire cache hierarchy has to be coherent and atomic. So anytime you're manipulating a capability anywhere in the cache hierarchy, it has to be atomic just like for any other kind of atomic word. As I remember, ARM produced hundreds, if not thousands, of ARM Morello board. So my question is, do we know where they're all gone? Um, well, I know the UKRI has quite a few sitting in their warehouse, um, or I think maybe the ARM has them in their warehouse waiting for UKRI to, to send them somewhere, so you should ask for them. That would make ARM happy. Um, there's also uh, some number of chips left, but I think Total, total, the back, total package chips is close to a thousand. Um, one, one thing I would would say though is there was a, a one of the programs that uh, UKRI has run, um, digital company called Digital Catapult, ran the technology access program. It's where companies applied to uh, use Cherry uh, and try it out in their some application, their product, and uh, one of one of the findings we had is we gave them boxes. They did stuff on them. We sent them instructions on how to send them back to Cambridge if they were done with them and they were just gonna go into storage and no one has sent one back. In fact, some people have specifically said, we have put this in our CI infrastructure, right? Because we found bugs and, some, and in some cases we issued security advisories. Uh, now, Cherry is not meant to be a bug finding tool. Cher Cherry is meant to be a mitigation tool, but nonetheless, it found bugs and it found security critical bugs for people. So, yeah. So, yeah, people don't want to give them back, which is sad because we have still have some room in the data center. Um, I would say one thing I didn't mention on the slide is that if you're interested in just playing around, um, you can get, um, you can contact us and we can get you access to a system or, what is the name of the, yeah, the GCC compile farm has access. So any. Any open source developer can request GCC compile form. Yeah, it is an old machine. We should fix it. But you know. yeah. But uh, anyway, we have we have one that anyone can any open source developer can get access to pretty easily. We can give you access. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention in the talk is actually that we have uh, that uh, Roslyn and Mark got Beehive ported to uh, ported to Cherry uh, Morello. So we have. We have Beehive support, and we can probably start giving out VMs and stuff like that. Um, although some fuzzing work is currently crashing the post on us, so there's, there's some work to do. We have not otherwise had problems. Hey, last one. For today, after we're done talking here, you can come bug probably Jessica, or you can bug one of us. Um, and we have a Morello box here. That's what we gave the presentation on. So we can do quick demos or show you things or run something in GDB if you'd like. And show you kind of what the experience is like. Oh. Yes, there, yeah, Christoph says, uh, mentions, yeah, we have a, a QMU as well. Uh, easy way to get access to that is uh, download Cherry Build and 
follow the instructions uh, to, to build, build everything. Uh, the, the fact that we can cross-build uh, cross FreeBSD on Mac OS and Linux is all a product of the work here because we needed it. We run all our CI and build all, all our releases, in fact, on Linux. So by way of testimonial, I, I played around with that during the Kitchener hackathon and found a number of bugs in PF, none of them sufficiently serious to be security issues, but you know, finding bugs is good. So I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting Cherry landing so that we can have CI jobs running our test suite on Cherry because it will explode in ways that it currently doesn't. I guess I, I would say, and I think most of us would agree, that the nice thing about developing on Cherry is that when you, when you write a buffer overflow, you get immediate feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of weird data corruption and excitement. Also, when you're debugging, looking at a pointer and getting how big it is, is also really nice. Also one question, so in GC, in GNU and in C actually, C99 uh, allows FAM, flexible array member. So that is like you can, in a structure you can define one array without any size. So, and we have used it in say in our Hyper-V drivers. So will Cherry will cause a problem in that type of cases where someone is using a flexible array member? Um, flexible arrays are, are fine. Uh, Subobject bounds I don't, is, uh, is fine. I think we, we understand them. We also understand that degenerate, you put a one, a one length array at the end of your structure case. Um, can't remember, are we actually implementing um, bound it to the rest of the structure? Yeah, okay, so we are, we are implementing a, a feature where if you take a reference to the to an array at the end, you get a, an object bounded to whatever was left. Okay, so it will not throw an error because it can grow till like for that structure if I have decided, for example, a page for the structure, so that the, because the flexible array member will be the last attribute of the structure, it can go and reach till the end of the page without creating a corruption for anything next. So, not quite sure what scenario you're describing. Um, so, like uh, for example, in case of Hyper-V, we have a flexible array member, which is the, l which we use to um, store a list of pages which we'll be passing to the TLB for mm -hmm. flushing for the guest address pages. So what we do, because it's a message we pass to Hyper-V, uh, we don't know how many uh, pages will be created. Yeah. So we create a flexible array member, and then based on the offsets of the VM offsets, start and end, we decide number of pages, and we fill up that flexible array member without wasting any extra space, because we know that total uh, area we have allocated for the structure which we are passing to the Hyper-V, max can we allow till uh, one page size. So that way we are not wasting memory and we are allowing a list of pages to be, list of addresses to be sent Hyper-V. So I believe you're saying that you allocate a page Yes. And then you have a, a variable length array and you may use part of a page. Yes. Um, what Cherry is going to care about is that you allocate a page. Yes. So the pointer is going to be page size. Yes. Only if you happen, if you have sub-object bounds turned on and you take a pointer to the array, it will only be the size of, it will actually be the size of the rest of the page because it's going to kind of chop off the front but leave everything else after. But if you're passing a pointer to the struct itself, it's always the whole page because that's what came back from the malloc that you brought. So... 
uh, uh, because uh, why I'm asking this thing? Because uh, if we have to change the drivers uh, for, because there will be upstreaming. So after the upstreaming, if we have to change the drivers for this kind of thing, for uh, VM uh, changes or PMAP changes, so that will be quite a good amount of work because we have to also check with Hyper-V teams or the lower level teams whether they will be accepting in that way or not because of the serialization and deserializations of the things. So that I think is. I think you'll be fine in this case. I don't think you'll actually require any changes. Assuming you're actually passing like the whole structure as the pointer you pass to something, then we're not going to do anything with it. And it's going to be the pointer you got from malloc. I will still say do a, a run on the uh, hyper v based systems in ARM. Well, you uh, ARM and AMD. Well, we'd have to have a Hyper-V that did sharing. <laughs> uh, I guess Lee Wen can help. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Which actually, it, it kind of brings up a point that we haven't even talked about, which is firmware. Um, it, it currently, it's not a solved problem on Morello even, where the firmware is not uh, pure capability firmware. So it, it'll be nice, for example, when all of the memory safety is in your firmware, not just in your OS kernel, but that's going to take some while to get to. All right. Well, I think we're good for today for this session, um, and I think I need to check the schedule. What's next? We're at three, right? Oh, wow, it's four thirty. What are we supposed to do? So we're supposed to have, well, I think my schedule is out of date. Good Lord. Okay. So, oh, the oh, bug busting is tomorrow. That's right. Okay. So we have a buffer. We were supposed to end at four. We went 30 minutes over. Um, but I think we actually have kind of free open space for hacking and other things till 5.30, and then we're supposed to kind of start leaving, I think, at 5.30 and head off to whatever dinner you want to have at 6 tonight. Um, so you're now kind of free to spend time either in group discussions or whatever else you'd like to do, but I think we're done with kind of organized talks for the, at least from the platform for today. Oh, yes, and in particular, if you'd like to come up, the Morello box is gonna be up here and you can come play with that and ask one of us. But thanks. <laughs>